We will begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to pray the prayer of St. Bernardine of Siena. O oh, my beloved St. Joseph, adopt me as thy child. Take charge of my salvation. Watch over me day and night. Preserve me from the occasion of sin. Obtain for me purity of body. Through thy intercession with Jesus, grant me a spirit of sacrifice, humility, self-denial, burning love for Jesus and the blessed sacrament, and a sweet and tender love for Mary, my mother. Saint Joseph, be with me living, be with me dying, and obtain for me a favorable judgment from Jesus, my merciful Savior. Amen. And Heavenly Father, as we come today together on this day three of this consecration to Saint Joseph, we ask you to pour out your spirit upon us to bring us closer to St. Joseph, to know and love him in a more intense way, so that we can know and love Jesus more intensely, more devoutly, and we can ultimately arrive in heaven to be with you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the way, when we started this on May 20th, it was the feast day of St. Bernardine of Siena. I forgot to mention that. He's a great one. And I have a lot of quotes from him um, in the book, and uh, they're really dynamic. And he has some uh, phenomenal thoughts on St. Joseph, which we'll, we'll read as the days go by. Okay, so preliminary stuff again. Remember, I'll do this every day. When I read through the comments in the evenings, if I pick up on anything that's happening with you guys, I want to address it. I want to I answer questions to the best that I can. I mean, you guys ask a lot of questions. I'm not going to be able to answer all of those. Um, so... As we begin now on day three, it's really important, really important, guys. I can't emphasize this enough, that you try your best to do the readings before we meet. Don't leave it till after we meet. Leave, do it before we meet on this live stream. That way you know kind of what's going on and you've already got kind of the basis. And I'm just going to build on that, okay? Try your best to do the readings before we meet. Some of you have told me that you don't have the book yet. And you're wondering, should you participate in this live stream? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're so happy that you're here. Don't bail out, please. Now, I, I do recommend that you get the book because you you kind of don't know what I'm talking about if you, ha if you don't have the readings. Uh, and you can do it later down the road. You really do want to devour this book because it's got all the stuff in it. But don't leave if you don't have the book, okay? You're more than welcome to be here whether you have the book or not, okay? Uh, St. Joseph wants to be a part of your life okay really and truly he does and then um a lot of people not so much you guys but in the past i remember the last three four months people have been asking me this a lot and um I, i'm surprised that they've asked it but I, I guess i didn't anticipate it so a lot of people when they are doing the days like today it really starts on day three they get to the bottom uh on page 18 of day three and they see where it says read our spiritual father and they've, I have received so many emails and stuff from people. They're like, Father, I don't understand. And I'm like, wait, what, what do you mean you don't understand? What's, what's hard to understand about that? But they're like, do I, just, do, I, do I just randomly read something from the second section of the book, The Wonders? I'm like, no. You read what it says. You read Our Spiritual Father. And then people have said, so I just read page 100? I'm like, dude, no. You've got to read that whole section. So it starts on page 100. That's what I'm saying there. And you read that section called Our Spiritual Father. Okay, that just that section. There's there's other sections around it before and after it. Don't read those. I'll tell you when to read those when the day comes up. So just to make it super clear, guys, at the bottom, if you see that, I'm going to show it to Facebook first so you guys can see it. Okay, and then YouTube at the bottom, it tells you what to read every day. After you do the, sub, the first little reading, then you do the secondary stuff. Because I've had people, you know, they're, they're tripping on it. They're like, I don't understand. Do I just randomly select one of the wonders and read? And I'm like, no. I'm like, Did, is there copies that don't have that on the bottom or something? They're like, no, you do what it says every day at the bottom. I tried to make it simple, but I, I guess some people, they didn't quite understand it. So let me just make that point, okay? So read that section. So today, for day three, remember, we're unpacking, and those are the all my notes. So, okay. So we're doing day three, unpacking, we begin to delve into the litany of St. Joseph. So our first one is, God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. And I start off with another quote from St. Peter Julian Imard. 
he probably is the most quoted saint in the book, along with Blessed uh, uh, Joseph William Joseph Chaminade. Uh, saint Peter Julian Imard says this, Our Heavenly Father has had only one saint to represent him on earth. Think about that. He's had only one saint to represent him on earth, the Heavenly Father. Hence, he bestowed everything he could on that favored saint and equipped him with all that he needed to be his worthy representative. Holy moly. Do you know what that means? Somebody could write a doctoral dissertation just on that those two sentences right there. He gave him everything to be his worthy representative. You know, that word representative is, is a huge word. Many others, uh, saints and popes, have talked about St. Joseph being the representative of the Heavenly Father or the icon of the Heavenly Father, the shadow of the Heavenly Father, the mirror of the Heavenly Father, the representative of the Heavenly Father, the image of the Heavenly Father, the reflection of the Heavenly Father. Oh, there's tons of different ways to say this, but that is so profound. And, you know, as I was thinking on it, you know, Jesus has a ton of people who represent him, you know, uh, basically, all of us who are Christians, for sure, right, by our baptism, we, we represent Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Priests, in a special way, represent Jesus. I'm in persona Christi. I act in the person of Christ. But only one man, only one, represented the Heavenly Father on earth for Jesus. So we could say about St. Joseph that he acted in persona Patris, in the person of the Father. That is so profound. What a dignity, what a privilege was given to St. Joseph. And that's why, you know, the, the Heavenly Father never became incarnate, right? The second person of the Blessed Trinity did. So he took on human nature and he has a face, he has hands, he has feet, he has a body. The Heavenly Father does not have hands, does not have feet does not have a body. Now, we depict the Heavenly Father as a bearded old man, and we, we depict the Holy Spirit as a dove, but we all know that the Holy Spirit isn't a bird, right? And uh, the Heavenly Father, he, he didn't become incarnate. He didn't take on a human nature. So by entrusting his, his, his fatherhood to St. Joseph, it's incredible because when, when Jesus would have received a hug, for example, from St. Joseph, it was as though the Heavenly Father was hugging his son through Joseph. That's amazing. That is so profound uh, a, a thought. And there's so much that we can, that we can unpack from this. Um, and St. Joseph, as I say in the beginning here on day three, is the only man that Jesus called Father. He's the only one. What a privilege. What a dignity. And as the days continue, we're going to see why that is. It's because of this that St. Joseph is the greatest saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary, because of that unparalleled dignity of his calling, of his vocation, of his mission to be the representative of the Heavenly Father for Jesus. What a privilege. What a privilege. Matter of fact, you know, there, there, I, I have this quote here that I want to read to you because it's, it's, it speaks to something I just mentioned. God the Father doesn't have a human nature. Yet every time Jesus saw St. Joseph, heard him speak, watched him work, or witnessed his chaste love for Mary, the humanity of Jesus witnessed a perfect reflection of the Heavenly Father. And Blessed William Joseph Shamanad says, God chose to make Joseph his most tangible image on earth. Remember, tangible, touchable. The Heavenly Father is not touchable. He doesn't have a human nature. God chose to make Joseph his most tangible image on earth, the depository of all the rights of his divine paternity. Do you know what that means? The husband of that noble virgin who is mistress of angels and men, queen of the cosmos, the Immaculata. Wow. I mean, what we're saying there, all the rights of his divine paternity have been given to St. Joseph. St. Bernardino Siena, right, the, the saint that we started this on, and I said the prayer from when we began today, says, This holy man, St. Joseph, had such towering dignity and glory that the Eternal Father most generously bestowed on him a likeness of his own primacy, of his own primacy. 
to remember that. Because when we talk about St. Joseph as being greater than all the other saints, except the Blessed Virgin Mary, primacy, primacy, he has it above all the others. Because he's the representative being filled with all those gifts and graces to be the one to speak to Jesus as a father. Wow. <laughs> okay, so let's go to our spiritual father. Remember, when you're done reading that section, you're going to go to page 100. And then after we do that, you will pray the litany on page 233. You're going to be very familiar with page 233 uh, by the end of these 33 days. So let's go to page 100 where we talk about the spiritual fatherhood of St. Joseph. You know, the church has a very, and has had for from the beginning, a very clear understanding of Mary's spiritual maternity for us. Very clear. Saints, and there's so much written on that. It's, it's you know, it's kind of a no-brainer. Some people don't get it, unfortunately, but it's, it's so true. It, it's incredible. But the church, you know, it's only slowly developed that parallel understanding of St. Joseph's spiritual fatherhood for us. It's kind of surprising, actually, that it took so long for us to understand this. And at the beginning of the church, there were actually people, sometimes even church fathers, who said, you know, maybe we really should not be calling St. Joseph the father of Jesus. And what they meant by that was they didn't want anybody to think that St. Joseph had fathered Jesus that there had been any marital relations between Joseph and Mary, or that the people didn't get confused and think that Joseph was the biological father of Jesus. So, okay, good intentions for sure. But scripture itself says that St. Joseph is the father of Jesus, and not biologically, but he's called the father, right? So that's important because there was so much confusion about that. St. Augustine, the great St. Augustine had to step up and kind of put this stuff to rest, and he said, look, he was not the biological father, we all know that, but he was a father because it was an authoritative, affectionate, and faithful fatherhood. That's what he was for him, and uh, that's that's vitally important, because, you know, as the church has, has gone throughout the centuries, there's a certain aspect where Jesus wants us to know and love St. Joseph, but it had to have its proper time. Because at the beginning of the church, it could have been very confusing, like even during the life of our Lord. And this is probably one of the reasons why, why St. Joseph was not there, had already died before the public ministry of Jesus, so that he wasn't there during his preaching during those three years or at the foot of the cross, uh, for many reasons, which we'll get into. But it could have been confusing. When he talked about his father and wanting to take you know, his friends, his disciples, to the kingdom of his father, people could have been like, wait, Joseph, he's in Nazareth? What, what, what are you talking about here? That would have been, you know, confusing. And so the greatness of St. Joseph is that he was more than willing to be, you know, in the background, to, to be the silent one, to step out. Not He didn't have to be center stage. And that humility shows the greatness of St. Joseph. Jesus knows that he can rely upon the humility of his dad, of St. Joseph, to, 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 so that he can fulfill his mission to save the world and bring people to the kingdom of the Heavenly Father. And that's part of what makes St. Joseph, you know, so, so great, so great. But the Lord has revealed on many occasions throughout history that he wants us specifically to, to talk and to have a relationship with St. Joseph as children to a father. And that's been slowly building, and now I believe it's, it's crescendoing Within the last 150 years, remember, St. Joseph was declared the patron of the Universal Church in 1870, rather late in church time. But what does the word patron mean? It comes from the word pater, which means father. So, you know, that, that's pretty huge. You know, if you use it in a, in, a, in a feminine way, like a woman is the patroness of this country, it means, kind of, you know, parental, parental. She's, she's got kind of a role there. Well, the root of it is from fatherhood. And that's what St. Joseph is for us. So there's one particular mystic in the 19th century, the servant of God, Sister Mary Martha Chambon, that Jesus said this, You must call St. Joseph your father, for I have given him the title and the goodness of a father. Now, I want to read this little statement for you from the book, because uh, I could formulate it here in a diff different way, but why not just read what it says here, because it's stated really well. If Jesus is your brother, and he is. 
Right? He's our Lord and Savior. He's our God. We worship him. But he became one of us. And he talks about that. After his resurrection, what does he say to his, to, to his disciples? Actually, to, to Mary Magdalene, he says, go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus calls us this. We are his brothers and sisters. If Jesus is your brother, his parents become your parents. Not physically, of course, but spiritually. Specifically, Jesus' mother becomes your mother. Jesus' father becomes your father. If Mary is your mother and Jesus is your brother, St. Joseph has to be your father. Any man married to your mother is your father. You can call him all different kinds of things. You can call him your foster father, adopted father, whatever, but your father's there. He's your dad. He's your father. Again, the filial relationship you have with St. Joseph is not biological. It wasn't biological for Jesus either, but he was still his dad. And Jesus loves you so much that he wants you to call St. Joseph Father. He wants you to find refuge in the paternal goodness of the best of all fathers. The, the, the man who can bring you closer to Jesus Christ and ultimately to our ultimate end, the Heavenly Father. That's the greatness of what we're talking about here. It is, it is absolutely profound. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I could say about different titles like foster father, adoptive father, and we'll get into that later because there's a certain one of the titles in the litany is foster father uh, of the Savior. We'll, we'll get into that later. I want to read another section to you uh, about this because it's important. Why did Jesus need the fatherhood of St. Joseph at all? Why did he need it if God was his father? And it's a good question. It's a valid question. Essentially, Jesus needed St. Joseph as a father because the human nature of Jesus required it. Remember, Jesus is, is in his divine person, he's, he's, he's God. His personhood is divine. But he has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. If he had two personalities, he'd be you know, schizophrenic. He, he, he wouldn't have, he, he'd be confused, right? There's no confusion in Christ. That's why a lot of people, they trip, they trip me out, man. And these are people with doctorates and really intelligent people, kind of, who, who say, hmm, when did Jesus come to awareness that he was God? <laughs> what a stupid question, man. You know, it's not like he was reflecting one day on the shores of Galilee. He's like, you know what? I think I'm divine, dude. I think I'm like the Messiah, bro. <laughs> that is so stupid. He was always God and his divine person, right? You get, you get people who, who contemplate this stuff and think that he became aware of it at some point. The personhood of Jesus Christ is divine always and forever, no beginning or end. But his, in his humility, he assumed a human nature, which meant that he had to grow, right? Human nature growth takes time. That's why the Messiah didn't just appear as a 33-year-old man out of the heavens. Poof. No. He chose to come into the world through the holy womb of the Virgin and grow, and that takes time. And although he created the heavens and the earth, he chose in his humility to learn things. He learned how to walk and how to talk from his mom and dad. That's, that's amazing stuff. When the Son of God became incarnate, he placed himself under the anthropological requirements of needing a father to love him, feed, educate, shelter, clothe, and protect him. Jesus, the incarnate God, is not a pure spiritual being. He is the God-man. He has a divine nature and a human nature. In his human nature, Jesus had physical, emotional, and psychological needs. This is something that is so often overlooked. God the Father doesn't have a body. He, God the Father doesn't have emotions, right? We have emotions because, you know, we're, we're, we're human beings. We, we have that. The Heavenly Father, you know, doesn't, you know, ha have temper tantrums or, 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 you know, he's indecisive about, you know, something. No, he doesn't have those kind of things. He always wills the good. He is goodness itself. He is life itself. There's no yin-yang in God. There's no 50-50 in it. Hmm, what am I going to do today? <laughs> That's not how it works in God, in the, in the everlasting trinity. Now, when Jesus, the second person, takes on human nature, he gets all these things. He gets a body and emotions and the ability to suffer. See, God can't suffer. But when the second person became flesh, he can. And he can make of that flesh the hinge of our salvation. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and we consume that flesh of the Messiah who redeemed us by his blood, by his passion, which means his ability to suffer. That's what passion is, passibility, the ability to endure suffering. But the Heavenly Father doesn't have that because he doesn't have a body. Therefore, God the Father entrusts his Son to the watchful, loving care of a human father. St. Joseph stands in the place of the Heavenly Father. He has been entrusted with taking care of the human nature, growth, and development of Jesus. Through the fatherhood of St. Joseph, Jesus grew into the fullness of his manhood. This isn't me making this up, guys. This is in the Gospel of Luke. That he grew in wisdom and stature before God and man under the watchful care of his parents. That's what we're dealing with here. Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is not some, you know, fairy tale or, or some kind of phantasm. He's the God-man. He has everything that, that constitutes being a true, you know, having a true human nature like we do. And that, that means he, that he needed that, that love and tenderness from a mom and from a dad. And God the Father supplied him with that, with giving him the perfect mother, the Immaculata, the Virgin Mary, and the perfect father in the person of St. Joseph. And you know, Jesus, a lot of people trip on this. Cause today you got all kind of weird theologians talking about, you know, Jesus is, um, uh, th- even some of them will, will start to change it so that they don't use masculine pronouns when talking about Jesus. <laughs> Whacked in the head, dude. He's a male. He's a guy. Yes, he's the God-man. But a lot of people today, you know, radical feminists get these crazy ideas and they start talking about Krista, right? They want it to end in some feminine, you know, s- syllable because they're trying to portray that he's androgynous. No, he's not androgynous. God became a male. And that doesn't mean that men are better than women. Not at all. Not at all. As a matter of fact, the greatest human person who ever lived was not a man. It was a woman the Blessed Virgin Mary. Remember, Jesus is a divine person, but the greatest human person who ever lived was not a man, was a woman. And she's better than any pope, priest, bishop, saint, don't matter who they are. She's greater than the angels. So it's not about, you know, that either. He chose this for a particular reason, because he's the bridegroom Messiah, come to to ransom and, and to romance his bride, souls, and to take them to the wedding feast of heaven. A lot of people get these crazy ideas today. And what does it mean to be a little boy? Because that's what Jesus was. That he had to look up to not only his mother, because there's only so many things that a mother can teach a boy. He has to have a father as a role model, as one that he looks up to. And this is so profound, man. This is so profound. Because think about this. This is not in the book, but it it, it came to me in prayer after this book was out and I was giving talks about St. Joseph. When God, when God wanted to to share the facial characteristics of one particular creature, of all the beautiful faces in the world that have ever been, and there's a lot of beautiful faces out there, right? I've seen them, beautiful faces. Of all of them, the one face that God wanted to have similarities to was the Virgin Mary. To maybe have her cheekbones, eye sockets, just like I look like my mom. Oh, you it's undeniable. If, I'm, if my mom was standing right here, everybody who sees my mother says, Father, you look just like your mom, right? We all do it. We, in some ways, we, we share those characteristics. When God wanted to have a face, even though he was a male, he chose to have the characteristics similar to the Blessed Virgin. Wow. What? What about St. Joseph? St. Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus. What? When God, remember, as a male, as a little boy, when God wanted to imitate somebody, do you know how profound this is? When God wanted to imitate somebody, he wanted to imitate Joseph. Do you know what great dignity that means for St. Joseph and who he is and what he he can do? God doesn't imitate me. God didn't imitate St. Dominic or St. Ignatius or St. Francis or any of the saints. God doesn't imitate angels. God doesn't call any of them me or you father. But when he wanted to have mannerisms, when God wanted to have mannerisms, when God wanted to have a particular accent, when God wanted to learn how to work and swing an axe and chop wood, 
Where did he learn those things from? Joseph. His dad. That's how it works for little boys. You know, Jesus even talks about this in the New Testament. He says at one point, a son can only see and do what he sees his father doing and, and, and saying. Jesus himself says that. And it's true. I mean, really and truly, if you were to see Jesus on some level, you would see Joseph. Right? Remember when Jesus says himself, in seeing me, you have seen the Father. That's what Jesus says. This isn't me making this stuff up. Jesus says this. I actually have the quote in here in this particular chapter. Um, it's in here. I, I don't can't find the moment, but it's in here. In seeing me, you have seen the Father. That's what he says to his disciples. And they're like, wait, what? How is that possible? Well, he's not saying that he is the Father. He's not the same person as the Father, but he's the Son of the Father. And so if you see Jesus, on some level, you're seeing a Joseph. Because the mannerisms, again, and I wrote some of these things down somewhere in here. Now I'm not going to be able to find it, of course. Um, the mannerisms, the accent, the way that he probably walked, the way that the God-man walked was probably similar to the way that Joseph walked. I mean, this is so profound. Maybe the way that he laughed. Maybe, maybe the way that he sneezed. I don't know. The, all of these kind of things he would have learned from his dad. When God wants to imitate somebody, he chose Joseph. Jesus wanted to be like Joseph. God, this is so mind-blowing. It's, it's crazy because it's so close to heresy, but it's not. When God wanted to act like somebody, when God wanted to be like somebody, he chose Joseph. This stuff moves my soul. This stuff moves my heart because I'm like, who are you, Joseph? What kind of man are we talking about here that, that God wants to be like you? Can you imagine if, if God, you know, were to say that to, to, to one of us and, and some, some nun in the convent started writing a diary and said, Jesus told me that he wants to be like me. The Vatican would be like, yeah, no, put that one on the ban list, right? That ain't how it works. But if Joseph wrote a diary, it'd be true. It'd be true. Damn, this stuff moves me so much. It's unbelievable. I got all kind of side notes here for you guys, too. And I'm going to skip some of those. We'll be here all night. So what does it mean that, that Jesus placed himself under that paternal care of St. Joseph? It meant that, that Joseph would have educated, would have fed, would have sheltered, would have clothed, would have protected him. That's what he did for, for the God-man. Let's... Let's go back in light of what I've been saying and, and, and hear those things again. Joseph educated God. <laughs> Joseph fed God. Joseph sheltered God. Joseph clothed God. Joseph protected God. Wow. See, that's what those are the same things that St. Joseph wants to do for us as his spiritual children. Because we're, we're brothers and sisters of Jesus. And we need those same things. And so Joseph is going to educate us. He's going to feed us. He's going to shelter us. He's going to clothe us. He's going to protect us. And he's going to do something else with, with us that he didn't need to do with Jesus. What does every good father do? He also corrects. A good father corrects. Now, he didn't need to do that with Jesus, of course. Jesus is perfect. He, you know, never. But for us, yes, we need this. See, this is something so vital today in our world that so many fathers need to know. And now they need to do it in a loving way, of course. They don't need to be an ogre about it and be some, you know, hard-fisted dad. No. But a father needs to correct. And we have so, we're not doing that today, right? A lot of people tend to forget that one of the works of mercy is to create, correct the sinner. You know, and, 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 and a good father does that in a loving, compassionate way, of course. But today, we, we've got so many children run amok in households that are in mess, even in the church, because fathers are not willing to correct. We have to be willing to do this. And so this is what St. Joseph is going to do for us. And we need a lot of correction today. Blessed William Joseph Chaminade says this, We are undoubtedly children of Mary, and this is our glory and our consolation. 
but we are also adopted children of St. Joseph, and this is no small reason for the confidence that we have in him. Jesus wants you to accept St. Joseph as your spiritual father. All right, let's skip ahead here. Now, why does this all seem to be coming to a head today? Why is the church, especially in the last 150 years since St. Joseph was declared patron of the church, right, father of the church, which means father not just of like buildings, but of us, you know, the, the Christian people, because we need him today. We need St. Joseph today more than we've ever needed him. And remember, Jesus himself said, you know, after his, his resurrection, he said the Holy Spirit would come and reveal all truth to us. So we've had developments of doctrine take place where we've gotten dogmas like Our Lady's Immaculate Conception, the Assumption, you know, relatively new in church history. I mean, think about it. It was only in 1854 that we got the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. It was in 1950 that we got the Assumption of Mary. It's not beyond possibility that we could get some kind of doctrinal dogmatic formulation about St. Joseph in the future. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit is, is asking the Christian people to pay close attention to St. Joseph and realize that in this time of chaos and confusion, both in the world and in the church, we need to go to Joseph. He's our spiritual father. He's going to feed us. And we're going to talk about that later. I can't, I'm so excited, guys, about some of these things that I'm going to be sharing with you. It's all in the book, but I'm just going to be kind of unpacking it. He's going to do so many wonderful things for us. He's going to do so many wonderful things for us. All right. I'm going to end uh, this section just by briefly mentioning uh, the cloak of St. Joseph. I love this kind of imagery. If you notice, I, I, in a lot of the commission artwork that I've done, which is in the book, most of them, or on the website, consecrationtostjoseph.org, these commission pieces, I, I always have him with the cloak on. Because, you know, oftentimes we see Our Lady and we talk about her mantle. And that mantle of Our Lady is, is a place of protection for us. It's a place of, of, of refuge for us where she shelters her children. And a lot of times you'll see her, you know, she's got her mantle outstretched and her children are tucked safely under there because Satan can't get at you when you're under the mantle of Our Lady. Well, it's the same thing with St. Joseph's cloak. He's our father. So he cloaks us. He covers us with his paternal you know, protection. And we need to seek refuge in that, uh, especially today. And that's why I've got a lot of these art that show that. But there is, and it's been in existence for a long time, a very popular prayer in the church called the Holy Cloak Novena. Now, I, I don't actually know why they call it a novena, because a novena is supposed to be nine days. That's what it means. The word novena means nine but in this one is 30 days. Uh, so it's like a super novena, I guess. And it is a super novena. It is powerful. So I mentioned that here. And I don't have the whole Holy Cloak novena in the book because it's actually really long. It's very involved on a daily basis, the prayers. But my friends, let me tell you something. When you're done making this consecration on, on June 21st, you might want to consider doing the Holy Cloak novena to St. Joseph for a particular intention. Like if you want the conversion of your husband or your wayward children or what, something else, right? Try that novena because it, it is really powerful. I've done it myself, and it is it is absolutely wonderful. And the uh, last thing I want to mention is the Carmelites. You know, they really I've been to places and little you know churches in the middle of nowhere in Mexico, and all of a sudden you come upon this beautiful artistic depiction in a Carmelite church or painted by a Carmelite that shows that cloak of Saint Joseph, and it's it's something to see. It's really really nice. Okay, my friends, so we're done for the day. What I want to do now is I want, and then I'm going to mention the, that contest again, and I have the image now that I told you I couldn't show you yet because I didn't have it to show you, but I have it now, and you're going to, oh, you're going to be tripping on this. You, are, I guess you can see it on the website already, but um, you're going to love it. Okay, so remember, page 233 is the Litany of St. Joseph, and I will pray the whole thing. You can pray it, uh, the responses from wherever you are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. God the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. 
Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And Heavenly Father, what a blessing that you have given to us, the great Saint Joseph, the man that you chose, that you poured so many graces into to be your representative for your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now you share his spiritual fatherhood with us. Help us to come to know and love him in ways that are deep and profound and life-changing so that we can be like him, so that we can imitate his virtues, so that we can be pleasing to you, drawing closer to Christ, and coming ultimately to you in the heavenly kingdom. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.